1995 was the year that Netscape introduced Netscape Navigator. And at the time, it was almost revolutionary, right? And uh, a lot of people moved to capitalize on that opportunity. Uh, one of the players was Microsoft, and they introduced Internet Explorer. And so, um, you know, the, the story of the decade became about the browser wars, you know, Netscape versus Microsoft, and we all know how that went. Uh, so, uh, at the same time, there was a different war that was happening. And it was um, not as out in the open, but perhaps more significant. And it was a war over this thing, the little padlock in the bottom left corner of your web browser. Um, and more importantly, the ideas behind it, cryptography. On the one side of this war were the cypherpunks. Uh, these were people who wanted to see cryptography used and spread widely throughout the world. And on the other side of the war were the eavesdroppers. And these were people that wanted to limit the use and distribution of cryptography. And so the lines were drawn. And on the cypherpunk side, you had people like, you know, Matt Blaze, Philip Zimmerman, Ian Goldberg, uh, David Shum, uh, the, the heroes of my teenage years. Um, and the government thought that these people were dangerous. In fact, their ideas scared the fuck out of them. They were talking about a world, you know, the, the, the shift in a world where they had ultimate control and ultimate access to all information that was transmitted globally to a world where they would have no control and no access to any information that was transmitted. In fact, they thought these ideas were so dangerous that they considered them to be weapons. Uh, they, they classified cryptography as a munition. And if you wrote a little bit of crypto code uh, in the United States and sent that to your friend over the border in Canada, that was the same as exporting Stinger missiles. And you could be tried and, and prosecuted as such. Uh, at the same time, the government realized that this whole like, cryptography privacy thing uh, might be important to some people. And so they had their own solution in the form of the clipper chip. Uh, which was a piece of hardware that they wanted to embed into every piece of consumer electronics, every telephone, every fax machine, um, every device. And it would perform cryptography and allow you to establish secure sessions with you know, somebody who had another computer or another device. Uh, the only catch was that the government had like a master key that they could use to decrypt all of the, the communication. Um, and so that's, that's how things uh, uh, were shaping up. Now, the, the government's problem is that uh, cryptography is not a banana, <laughs> which is to say that information cannot be, is not the same as an object, right? If you have a banana and you share it with your friend, there's still only one banana in the world. Uh, you know, if you write a little bit of crypto code and you share it with your friend, there's two pieces of crypto code in the world. And, um, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the cypherpunks mantra at the time was cypherpunks write code. Um, and so people got to work. Uh, some people moved to this island in the Caribbean called Anguilla, which had favorable laws uh, concerning the, the export and distribution of cryptography. And they started writing these clean room implementations of cryptography and then you know, shipping it throughout the world. Uh, other people moved to this place, the Principality of Sealand, uh, which is an old World War II anti-aircraft gun platform uh, that was built by the British and then abandoned. Uh, and it's in the mi middle of the English Channel in international waters. Uh, so this crazy guy whose name is Roy Bates in the 1960s uh, just went out there and like claimed it. He like colonized it as his own. Uh, and since it's in international waters, uh, he says that it's his own country. Uh, he originally did that to um, broadcast pirate radio, like rock and roll, uh, back into the UK. Uh, but so a bunch of people went out there to do like a data haven cryptography project. And then back in the United States, uh, people tried other things. Um, in 1995, Philip Zimmerman published this book called PGP, Source Code and Internals. And uh, the whole deal is that it was a book with the PGP source code printed in a machine-readable font. Uh, so you could take the book and then easily scan it in uh, and, and get software out of it. And so the idea is that um, you know, if you write if you have like a digital representation of cryptography, that's a weapon, but if you print it into a book, then that's speech. <laughs> and in the United States, you know, you can't ban books, right? Uh, so, you know, very limited print run. Uh, you know, they, they did that and, you know, mailed it to a few places in the world and then those people scanned it back in. Uh, 
And stuff like this continued until 2000, when the Clinton administration repealed all of the, most of the significant laws uh, limiting the use and export of cryptography. And it kind of seemed like the game was over, you know, that the war was won, that we'd really done it. Um, but if you go back and you look at the cypherpunk predictions of what would happen once we'd won this war, um, it's somewhat less clear. Um, you know, first of all, the first prediction was that they would win. And I think that this, that was the most prescient thing. This is one of the first times that we saw that information really does want to be free. Um, but their other predictions of what would happen um, were somewhat less prescient. Um, they thought that anonymous digital cash would flourish, that intellectual property would disappear, that surveillance would become impossible, that governments would be unable to continue collecting taxes, and that governments would fall. Flash forward 20 years, and if we're honest with ourselves, cryptography is the thing that allows us to securely transmit our credit card number to Amazon.com so we can buy a copy of Sarah Palin's book on going rogue. <laughs> uh, and as we now know, holy shit, uh, they are surveilling everything. Uh, in fact, uh, surveillance is probably at an all-time high, and privacy is probably at an all-time low. So what happened? You know, um, you know, there's all this cypherpunk activity. We won this war. Shouldn't our like emails, texts, phone calls, messages, shouldn't that all be encrypted? Nope. None of it. Uh, okay. So what were these people doing in Sealand and Anguilla and stuff? You know, didn't like there's this whole movement. Like, what did we get? Uh, we got this. Uh, PGP. Uh, has ever, anybody here ever tried to use this? PGP? Okay, wow, not very many people. Well, you're not missing much. <laughs> uh, do people at least know what this is, PGP? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, so, one way to explain this is that, in many ways, uh, the cypherpunks were preparing for a future, right? And the, the future that they saw was a future of proximate surveillance. It was the future of the clipper chip, right? Remember that they were going to embed this piece of surveillance technology into every piece of consumer electronics. And the people that were you know, writing this crypto code had just coming, come from like, seeing the matrix in the theater, right? Um, and so that's the future that they, they imagined. And instead, we got this future of oblique surveillance, um, which is subtly different. Um, you know, to, to give you an example, you know, if I asked how many people here would be OK with a law they required them to carry a government-mandated tracking device on them at all times. Probably not many people would opt into that. But then if I asked, how many people here have a cell phone? I imagine almost everyone in the room would raise their hand. And so what's the difference? You know, A cell phone is just a thing that reports your real-time location to a handful of telecommunication companies which are required by law to provide that information to the government. You know, so what's the difference between a government-mandated tracking device and a cell phone? Well, the difference is choice, right? Like, you choose to have a cell phone. You wouldn't necessarily choose to have a government-mandated tracking device. But it's a complicated choice, um, because you know, what starts off as a choice between whether you have a piece of consumer electronics in your pocket or not slowly becomes a choice between whether you participate in society or not. That, in some sense today, the choice not to have a mobile phone is a choice not to participate in society. And that's something that the cypherpunks didn't really see coming. Um, so, you know, back in 97, at the dawn of the Internet's potential, the hypothesis for private communication was simple. We'll just develop really powerful tools for ourselves and then teach everyone to be like us. And PGP is the result of that origin story. You know, we got software that looks like this. Um, you know, should the underlying block cipher that you use when you communicate with somebody be serpent, idea, two fish, or AES? That's up to the user. <laughs> the GPG man page is 16,000 words long. Uh, for comparison, the novel Fahrenheit 451 is only 40,000 words long. And so this leads to like, all kinds of usability to disasters. You know, people say things like, I send you my private key to communicate privately, right? Uh, which is not how it works, by the way. Uh, but so if you know, we sort of break this down, the way that PGP works, uh, you know, you've got someone, Alice, and she wants to communicate privately. And so she has what's known as a key pair, uh, a private key and a public key. 
And uh, she may want to communicate with people like Bob, Charlie, and Dave. And so what she does is she sends them her public key. Her public key doesn't need to remain secret. She could broadcast it widely. Anyone can know it. It's sort of like if you imagine um, I send you an open, unlocked safe that you don't know the combination to, and then you put your message in the safe, and you close the door, and you spin the knob. Now, even you can't unlock the safe, and then you just mail me back the safe. Um, now, at the same time, uh, there's someone else that we need to consider, Eve, the eavesdropper. <laughs> and so whenever Bob, Charlie, and Dave uh, want to communicate with Alice, they just use Alice's public key to encrypt a message and send it to Alice. Now, Eve is going to be there. Eve is always there. And you know, Eve can observe these messages in transit. But since Eve doesn't know Alice's private key, she can't decrypt this. It's just ciphertext. Right? Um, so the thing is that every single time Bob, Charlie, Dave, and anyone else sends Alice a message, they use the same key over and over and over again for years at a time. And Alice, or, I'm sorry, Eve can just store this ciphertext for years at a time, you know, collects years of traffic. And maybe she can't decrypt it, but she just stores it. And then maybe if one day she's ever interested in Alice, she goes to Alice and somehow compromises Alice's private key. Either she physically seizes the device that it's on and extracts it, or she coerces Alice somehow or compels her through legal action or something like that. But at the moment that that happens, now Eve can go backwards in time and decrypt every single message that has ever been sent to Alice <laughs> over years. Right? So PGP has some problems, right? Like uh, it lacks this. So that phenomenon is what's known as future secrecy. So it lacks this thing forward. Uh, I'm sorry, it's known as forward secrecy. It lacks this phenomenon known as forward secrecy. It also lacks deniability. So if I send you a PGP signed message, you know that it came from me cryptographically, but there's no way for me to deny it if you show it to anybody else. You know, what you want is for me to send you a message, and you know it came from me, but you can't prove to other people that it came from me. And then, you know, complicated setup and usage. Uh, basically, what we're saying is that PGP is like a museum of bad 1990s cryptography and an interface that was designed in the same era as Lotus Notes. <laughs> you know, nobody uses Lotus Notes anymore. I don't understand why we would expect people to use PGP. Yeah. Um, this may seem obvious, uh, but like people in the security community, like myself, are so brain damaged that it, it takes us a while to figure that out. Um, so what do we need? Well, what we need is something that has limited damage from key compromise, um, you know, to to uh, deal with that Alice scenario. Uh, we need something with opinionated defaults. You know, we shouldn't have a man page that's 16,000 words long. We need something that has opportunistic, transparent encryption and is mobile-oriented, works in multi-device setups, and is generally like, suited for the modern world. Um, basically, what we need is to make the lock icon a thing of the past. Um, as they say, one-click encryption is one-click too many. Uh, so what we did was we, we uh, thought about it, and we worked for four years on a, a new cryptographic protocol called Axolotl. And Axolotl is asynchronous which means it works on mobile devices. Uh, it supports multi-device. Um, it has both forward and future secrecy, and it has this deniability property. And uh, the way it works is uh, through what we call a ratcheting forward secrecy protocol. Uh, and essentially what's happening is that as you're communicating with somebody, the key material that you use to communicate is ratcheting forward, which means it moves forward and cannot move backwards. And the old key material is destroyed as soon as it's used. So if somebody records a whole bunch of ciphertext for years at a time, and then they come and seize your device, there are no keys on the device that can be used to go back and decrypt those old messages, uh, which is exactly what we want. Um, we also um, worked on the, um, the, the key distribution flow. So instead of like copying and pasting stuff around, uh, the way it works is you have a device, and um, it communicates with um, a server that is uh, you know, mediating your messaging. And when you want to send a message, uh, you first contact the server and you ask for the next uh, cached key for the recipient of the message. Uh, the server responds with uh, what's known as an identity key and the next key that's available. Um, and then your phone generates a new ephemeral key um, and uses that to encrypt a message, send it to the server, and the server uh, responds that it has received the message and then forwards it on to the recipient. So this all happens behind the scenes um, 
in a normal messaging flow, and it only adds one round trip to the server the first time that you uh, communicate with a specific recipient. Uh, in cryptography, there's always this question of how you deal with key validation. So if you see a public key for somebody, how do you know that it's really their public key and not you know, Mallory's public key or Eve's public key? Uh, and so we use a model called TOFU, which is trust on first use. Uh, so the first time you see a key for somebody, you just assume that that's the good key for them. Uh, this is similar to how SSH does things. Um, and if that key ever changes, then we notify the user and uh, prompt them and, uh, until they, they approve it. Um, because of that simplification, a user doesn't need to know what a key is, and a user doesn't need to know what a fingerprint is uh, if they don't want to. And if we're honest, most people don't want to. Uh, so what do we get for all this? Uh, well, what we get is a messenger that looks like this. Uh, so we took the protocol and we built a whole uh, messenger around it. And um, this is the Android client. It's called TechSecure. And the idea is that it looks just like any other messenger. There's nothing special about it. You don't have to know what if, how cryptography works. You don't have to you know, do key exchanges and ASCII armor. There's no command line options. Um, it's just a, a normal messenger. And uh, you know, given that we had that, we were able to demonstrate that this technology really worked in a frictionless way, in a way that could be truly invisible. And uh, since what we do is open source and we don't have any patents or intellectual property on our protocol or any of the software that we write, we were able to take this and give it to WhatsApp, uh, which is the most popular messaging app in the world. Uh, they're larger than SMS. Um, and we have started an integration with them where we're integrating our protocol into, the, um, into their clients so that if uh, you communicate, if you use WhatsApp and you communicate with any WhatsApp user, when the integration is done, your communication will all be end-to-end uh, -end encrypted, and you might not even know it. Um, already, uh, where we are in the, in the integration, uh, we believe that this is the largest deployment of end-to-end -end encryption in history. Um, and we think that this is the kind of mass adoption that can actually um, put a cramp in the style of, of mass surveillance. Uh, in general, uh, what we found is that if you code, you design. And if you design, <laughs> usability matters. And if your software isn't usable, nobody's going to use it. Um, but that usable crypto can stop mass surveillance. This is the kind of thing that we're going to continue working on at Open Whisper Systems. Um, we're not done. We want to do more integrations and keep pushing this until um, all communication is end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, it's an open source project, and uh, so uh, we invite everyone to join us, uh, and we hope we see you there. Thanks.